Today is um, in our text, we're in Romans chapter 16. So this will be the last uh, of the book of Romans before we move into a different uh, study, a different series altogether. So it's 20 some uh, uh, verses, 27 verses in the book of Romans. And uh, the first 16, I'm not going to cover verse by verse, and so, and it's also full of names, and it's really hard to pronounce, so I've asked one of the young people to read that for me. <laughs> so, uh, Brother Noel, I think you're, you're up, so come on up for the reading. Sorry about that. You'll be fine. Good morning, church. Um, so, as Pastor Ken said, I'll be reading from... <laughs> Verses 1 to 15. Would you all stand with me? I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sincaria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she needs of you. For indeed, she has also been a helper of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Jesus Christ, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my brother Epanetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Adronicus and Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, who were also in Christ before me. Greet Ampelos, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Sacchius, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are in the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodion, my countryman. Greet those who are in the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Tithenia and Tryhosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, Philagon, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and brethren who are also with them. Greet Philogus and Julia, Nerus and his sister Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Noel. <laughs> Don't usually get an applause, do you? <laughs> well read, well read. Let's go ahead and start off with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for... The whole book of Romans, Lord, for the doctrinal treasure that it is to the Christian faith. Thank you for all that we have gleaned from it over these uh, past months. And Lord, I pray that we would hold these things dear in our heart. That, That these truths that we have gone over would indeed change our thinking. That in turn changes our, our actions and how we live. Lord, today help us to Finish up this book, better understanding, uh, well, the church in Rome, but uh, also, Lord, to gain some wisdom in how we live, caution of what we need to be watching out for, change us, Lord. If there's anybody here who is unsure of their own relationship with you as God and Creator, Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit would do a gracious work in that heart, open their eyes, let them see the beauty of Christ. I pray, Lord, that they would come to faith. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 16. We've been through the book of Romans. There's been a lot of fantastic doctrine. Uh, The doctrine of salvation by grace. The doctrine of of uh, mankind's sin, our original sin, our inherited sin. 
uh, the doctrine of sanctification and how we are to grow and live and be sanctified in our lives, the teachings of how we are to interact with brothers and sisters, uh, how we are to interact with people that we disagree with and may not see eye to eye on. Uh, these are some important uh, doctrines and teachings that we've gone over. And so in this uh, last chapter, he has a few more things. He, he has some greetings that he gives, as Brother Noel has read to us, some great appreciation. But you can tell from this uh, that, that he had a, uh, a deep connection with the church in Rome, even though he hadn't even been there. Do you realize that? He hadn't visited yet to Rome, but yet he knew all these people. He knew about them and what their character was, what their involvement was. So he was deeply connected in the lives of the people here at Rome. And, and that's very clear. So first, I want to take a look at this personal greetings list of Paul. Again, like I said, I don't want to go line by line because, well, it's already been read by Noel, and, and I don't know if I can do any better than, than Noel did. So we won't go line by line, but we see this long list of people that Paul sends affection to as well as commendation. Uh, Paul had been in many major population centers around the known world in Jerusalem and Antioch and Philippi, Athens, Corinth, Ephesus. And so along these journeys of Paul, he had come into contact with many of these transient people and these trade routes and, and what have you. And so, so he had surely had some connection with some of these people as well as having heard from uh, the church itself, I, I, I would imagine. And so he had relationship. He knew many of these people. Uh, he knew many of these by name. Phoebe, Aquila, Priscilla, Epinatus, Ad Adronicus, uh, Junia, Herodian, and uh, so on and so forth. But in this list, I want us to notice three things in particular about the church in Rome. Because this list reveals something to us. The first thing that I want to point out about the church in Rome is that it was racially diverse. That's important. This is the church of Jesus Christ. Racially diverse. Now, when I say racially diverse, uh, numerous times we speak of race here at the church, and I emphasize the that we have one race in this world, and that is humanity, the human race, because God created man and woman, God created Adam and Eve, one Adam and Eve, and from them, all the peoples of the earth, whereas having a, a, a different uh, secular take on creation kind of involves people, uh, races evolving at different rates and different levels, whereas the biblical view is one man, one woman. We all came from that. So when I say race, keep that in mind. When I say race, I'm talking about uh, people, groups from all parts of the world. Okay? So they were racially diverse. Many here obviously had Roman names. Urbanus, Adronicus, Junia. These are common Roman names. And so they were Roman Gentiles who became Christians and added to the church. Some were... Uh, of Jewish origin, like Mary or Miriam mentioned here. Not sure what Mary this was. I don't think it was any of the other Marys in the Gospels, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus. But they, it was a Miriam, uh, likely a Jewish believer who became Christian. And so again, in the church, as we've gone through the whole book, we've seen uh, those who were saved out of paganism, those who were saved from Judaism, and they became believers and followers of Jesus Christ. But together, they are one. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, but we are a new body in Christ. Not only that, but likely, there were people even of color in this mixture, in this church. I say people of color because I don't know exactly what color, but likely of darker skin of some kind. Why? Rufus is mentioned here. Uh, Brother Noel mentioned a fellow named Rufus. Rufus is also mentioned in Mark chapter 15. And most scholars that I have looked into believe this to be the same Rufus. 
Who was Rufus? Over in Mark 15, when Jesus was being led through the streets of Jerusalem, he stumbled. He had a hard time carrying the cross. He had been beaten. He had been whipped. Uh, he was bloodied. And he was made to carry his own cross through the streets to Golgotha, to the place of the crucifixion. Verse 21, then they compelled a certain man. Do we have the verse or not? Okay, good. Then, uh, nope, nope, nope. Uh, we're, we're on Mark chapter 15. Do we have Mark 15? There's some issue going on up there. I'm not sure what, but listen carefully or follow along in your Bibles, please. Mark 15, verse 21. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. Now, these are the soldiers. When it says they compelled, they says, you over there, come here. You're carrying this. you got to help him. And so he did. Uh, again, the common consensus here is that Simon, a Cyrenian, an area in northern Africa, would likely have been a darker-skinned man. Tradition states, and when I say tradition, we're talking about extra-biblical writings, early church writings, early church fathers. Uh, but tradition states, it's not in the Scripture, that his two sons... These men, uh, Alexander and Rufus, became Christian missionaries later in life. Uh, how, did they? Did they not? Not sure. But we believe that Romans 16, this is that Rufus, the son of Simon, the Sarvinian, who carried the cross of Christ. It's Rufus likely being a darker skinned man too. What we have here is a very mixed church. This is IBC of Rome. This is the International Baptist Church of Rome. It's a good thing to see. This is, I believe, the way uh, God, the way Christ intended for his church to be. I've mentioned this statement before. I believe it was, well, I know it was Martin Luther King Jr. And later, President Obama had referred to this. But Martin Luther King Jr., who stated... That the most segregated time in the U.S. is at 11 o'clock a.m. on Sunday mornings. The most segregated time in the U.S. is at 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings. This was not the Church of Rome. This is not the way that it should be. People gather together for a concert. They gather together for stadiums. Uh, but when it comes time for church, in many places... Many places, I'm talking about across the U.S. in particular, but in many places when it comes time for church, let's keep ourselves separated. My friends, that's a shame. Over the years, even here at IBC, there's been times where people come and they say, uh, shouldn't we start an afternoon church for uh, uh, Asian or Chinese? Shouldn't we start an afternoon church for people from uh, Hong Kong, or shouldn't we start one for uh, South Africans, or shouldn't we start one for Filipinos, and uh, we've had suggestions along these lines, and our desire, now we know there's times when we need uh, language spoken in a particular language for, uh, for people to understand, I'd rather have people understand the gospel than sit and not get a thing out of it, but our desire as a church has always been, let's keep the church together as best we can as one body in Christ and will work as best we can to help people understand what is being taught, what is being said. And that's been our desire. Not only racial diversity, but we see secondly, social diversity in the church of Rome. Socially diverse. Many names given here. Some of the names given were of very common names for slaves at the time. Uh, many were also higher ranking people. Example, verse 8 talks about Amplias uh, in uh, verse 8. That was a common name for slaves of the emperor's household. It was a common name. Was he? It doesn't say so and so who was a slave or is a slave, but it is quite possible. 
Uh, Herodian indicates a relative of the Herod family, which indicates that he was someone of stature, perhaps, or at least born into a family of stature of some kind. Of interest, also, is two names in verse 12, uh, Tryphena and Tryphosa. Tryphena and Tryphosa. Uh, some suggest that these are possibly twin sisters. Their names literally mean delicate and dainty. Isn't that sweet? You have twins, you name them, you'll be delicate, you'll be dainty. They're going to be lovely. And so here we have this delicate, dainty twins. Here we have people of high stature, people of low stature. This is the Church of Rome, a socially diverse mix of people. Not only that, but we have a gender diverse group. Uh, nine of the 26 mentioned here are women. Nine of the 26 mentioned are women. And four of those women are referred to as working hard for the Lord. And so he's not just praising and mentioning all the men of the church and saying they're doing a fantastic job. He's mentioning the women. This is significant. may not be significant to you in 2024 here, but it is significant at this time in Rome. It is significant indeed. Um, uh, women were not given the same class and authority as men in general, across the known world at the time. They were thought of more as second-class citizens and treated as such. So for them to be so praised and used and mentioned and commended for their service to the Lord by the Apostle Paul, this is significant. It is special. And so IBC of Rome was a very mixed church. But in Christ, they form a family. And this is what Paul is commending them for. And I think a part of why Paul is focused on mentioning them person by person. He said in Galatians 3.23, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. That was Paul's attitude to the church of Christ. Your ethnicity, where you come from, uh, that, that, that's, who, that's who you come from. Your cultural position in this world, slave or free, whatever you came from is okay. Male, female, it doesn't matter. In Christ, we are a body. We are one body. Paul is praising and commending the church in Rome for this very thing. And he ends this section with this admonition. I don't think uh, 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 Noel read verse 16. I'm not sure why. Uh, uh, maybe he was embarrassed to read it. I don't know. Because when I was Noel's age, I loved this verse. When I was Noel's age, a single fellow in a church, this was one of my favorites. And I went around trying to convince the other young ladies that we got to be obedient to the word of God. <laughs> Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The Bible tells us. The Lord tells us to greet each other with a holy kiss. In the Old Testament, uh, kissing of friends and people close to you on the forehead or on the cheek or on the beard was a common way of greeting. It was an intimate way of greeting. But it was a way of saying I see you and I accept you. You are special to me. You belong to me. And the church continued this practice. Uh, some people may have been outcasts. Again, we had slaves. We had uh, people of stature, male, female. We had people from many different cultures. And so they may have been outcasts where they were or not welcomed in some places as much. Uh, but here in the church of Christ, greet one another with a holy kiss. Emphasis on the holy part. <laughs> greet one another in this special way that says you are welcome here. You belong here. You are part of us. We are family in the Lord. That's what this is talking about. I'm not suggesting that we go around kissing from now on. Okay, that's not my point. And there may be other cultural uh, norms throughout the centuries that have come and gone and changed. But whatever it is, uh, we need to make sure that we realize we're family. 
and we treat each other as such. And whether it's with a hug, whether it's with a handshake, whether it's with an arm around or a pat on the back, uh, we're family. And we need to honor and respect and love each other in that way. And so that's what Paul was commending the church and urging them to continue to do. Second thing, he goes on next. As we move on to verse 17, he says, don't be simple-minded. Any simple-minded people here? Nobody raising their hands. Okay, this is for you. Simple-minded people, this is for me. Don't be simple-minded. He says in verse 17, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Verse 18, for those who are such, do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Paul say in church, be smart, be wise. Put your brain in the gear. Keep your focus on the word of God. Don't be simple. Don't be easily uh, led away by uh, smooth words and flattering speech. Smooth words and flattering speech. The phrase deceive the hearts of the simple. The word simple here simply means unsuspecting or naive. So don't be unsuspecting. That is, you're expecting. Expecting what? Expecting that not everything that you hear that claims to be Christian is good. Not everything you hear that says that they are teaching God's word is a good teaching. And so he says, don't be naive, don't be unsuspecting. Be mindful and always compare what does God's word say? What does the Bible say? Uh, Do you know what the smooth words and flattering uh, speech are? Listen, if you start off with flattery, uh, people will listen more. And so this is the kind of speech that the people were getting a little bit. Uh, Flattery. For example, I realize that you guys in here are smarter than the average people out there. So I know you're going to get what I'm going to be able to, what I'm going to be telling you. And you're thinking, oh, yes, I am a bit smarter than average people out there. So tell me, what is this new stuff that you're going to give to me? Start off with flattery. Flattery will get you everywhere. Be mindful of this next verse, by the way. This next verse, Proverbs 27, verse 6, says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The wounds of a friend, of course, this is a metaphor. This is talking about a friend, someone who really cares, will give you what is true. They give what is true. Uh, Kisses of an enemy... That is that flattery that we're talking about here. Someone who butters you up because they want something else from you. They want to give you something else. He tells them, don't be naive. Some people don't serve Christ, but they serve their own belly. That's what he said. They serve their own belly. What does that mean? You know, belly, what are we doing today? You know, I'm hungry. What this is talking about is a fleshly desire that's another way of putting it so serving your own belly is metaphorical for your fleshly desires Uh, uh, the very immediate context would be i'm hungry therefore i need to eat something okay that's the fleshly desire my belly is saying it's time to eat i don't have time for anything else where's the food it's being led around by the flesh as opposed to the spirit um That means those serving their own fleshly desires. Could be varied what these desires are. Some could be out for money. Some could be out to be famous. Others just like the feeling of being important. Uh, Someone's listening to me. I'm important. What What I say matters. But this is different than serving in the spirit. Paul was wanting them to realize the difference here, not be gullible, not be naive, realize there are some out serving their own bellies, living and ministering and working in the flesh. 
So just know this. Not every teacher, preacher that you might come across is going to be helpful. Just know that. that, that, that that's a good starting place to wisdom. Uh, it frustrates me at times when I hear Christians not exercise that kind of discernment. That just because something sounds interesting or they have a higher degree than you do or uh, they, they must know what they're talking about. Just know that doesn't always add up. It doesn't always mean that's the case. Sometimes they may speak smooth. Like Paul says, smooth speakers. That means it's hard to argue with them. You may not be able to. They may come across a lot more intellectual than you, a lot more intelligently than you. And it's hard to argue with that. They're smooth. But is it scripture? Is it biblical? Is it right? If you're not sure, and hopefully at times as you're growing, as you are uh, being grounded in the word of God, you might hear something and there's a little bit of a red flag that might go off. Pay attention at least to the red flag and maybe ask a, a mature brother or sister in Christ or ask one of your church leaders, uh, what do you think about this? That's, that's okay. We all, we all get to those places as well. Ask for help. I spoke with a lady years ago telling me how much Jesus had helped her in her life. And I thought, great. You know, that's, he's amazing. Uh, without Christ, I'd be lost. I thought that was wonderful. But then she goes on to tell me how she had listened to somebody speak. And, and, and so she followed their advice. And she had leg problems, leg pains. And, and so what she did, what she followed was she put her physical Bible under her leg at night to sleep on top of it. And then morning, her leg felt so much better than it did the night before. Praise God. Guys, that's bad theology. Okay, that's Christian hocus pocus and Christian witchcraft. And there's too much of that kind of stuff out there, though. You pass on this uh, post before they take it down, and then God will give you a blessing. Something along those lines. Have you seen those? I'm sure you have. I don't know why, by the way, but for some reason, uh, I, I do look at Facebook some, but for some reason, my Facebook has been getting filled this past couple of months with weird stuff. Uh, a very, what's the word for it? Strange stuff like that. Just oddball stuff. I don't know why. I'm not trying to find oddball stuff, but they're thinking I want to see some oddball stuff like this. Be careful. Be aware of it. There's going to be more oddball stuff coming this year. And I think that you as Christians need to be aware of it. Uh, I don't know how it all works, but it happens. And especially when the U.S. seems to go into election times. Four years ago was a nightmare. Not just because of the carry on and nonsense, but because Christians were jumping on all kinds of weird rabbit holes on social media. So be aware of it. It's going to come. It's okay. It doesn't have to just throw your faith out the window. But be aware. Be mindful. And say, wait a second. Is this biblical? If you're not sure, if there's just red flags, ask somebody. Get some help on it. Find out more. Ask a brother or sister who can help you in it. Oh. Don't use your Bible like that either. It's not a bandage. Read your Bible. Study the word of God. Okay? Put it in your heart. Not literally. But that means know what it says and memorize it. Oh, where are we going here? Um, smooth talk. Be aware of things. Others have uh, heard that some other reason for any sickness or for any attitudes or for any pains or problems, illness, disease, that it must be because there's a demon that needs to be delivered. They call them deliverance ministries. It's a, big, it's a pretty big thing. Be careful. Uh, 
listen, uh, people, I've known some people that go down this path. I'm not, we believe in angels. We believe demons. We believe in spiritual warfare. But the Bible tells us how to handle that spiritual warfare. And it's not through constant confrontation or constant looking around the house to see if there's something that has a demon in it that you need to cast out. Taking on the armor of God. Staying close to God. Walking with God. Not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to stand. You'll know what the good and perfect will of God is. This is how God wants Christians to live. Some people think that having the favor of God on you means things like he will open up front row parking at the mall when you go shopping. Or that God never wants you to experience sickness. Or that God wants to give you a bigger house than you ever imagined possible. Or that God wants you to always have plenty of money. And These are things. These are smooth talk. But it's not consistent with good biblical exegesis, biblical study. Uh, What does the word of God have to say? Be like the Bereans in the Bible. In the book of Acts 17, they're commended. Paul writes in verse 10 of Acts 17, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness. They listened to what they had to say and searched the scriptures daily to find out what these things, if the, whether these things were so. They searched the scriptures. They said, oh, that sounds interesting. That sounds good. And then they went home and searched the scriptures to see if it adds up, to see if it's correct. Is it biblical? Is it right? And you need to do that. Do that here. I would be tickled if you went home and searched the scriptures. Uh, Don't take what I say for granted or uh, as absolute unless it agrees and confirms with scripture. I've said before, my authority as a speaker, as a preacher, as a pastor, isn't in my degrees. It's not in uh, my speech, my ability to speak. My authority that I have is the word of God. And where I stray from the word of God, I'm straying from authority. That's my authority. And so, is what I say a a biblical focus, biblical minded? They didn't have YouTube back then. Praise the Lord. They didn't have YouTube. But apparently they had something. They had people coming in to the church and... The smooth talkers, uh, the flattery speakers, they they were coming in doing the same kind of thing. Same kind of thing as YouTube does. You get on, you see something, and maybe it's a bit out there and weird. Next thing you know, you see a whole bunch of new videos that are out there and weird too. And you jump on those, and then it gets deeper and deeper. Be mindful. Think. Be careful of that kind of stuff. Don't be simple-minded, unaware, gullible, naive. But now this. Number three, be simple-minded. Oh, after all that, we go back to saying, now be simple-minded. Paul's clever, though. I think Paul is clever in his use of words. Uh, The actual Greek words here that he uses for simple both times here, they're translated simple in English, but they were actually different, slightly different. They were similar, they were related, but they were different. He says in verse 19, for your obedience has become known to all. Again, he started off chapter 1 with this. The whole world has heard about you, your faith, your obedience to the gospel. He says, your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Simple. That word simple. We are to be wise, intelligent. Um, think about what is good. We are to be simple-minded, however, concerning what? Evil. Be simple when it comes to evil. When I think of someone who's simple-minded concerning evil, this is not a bad thing. This is something that Paul is saying, this is good. 
But when I think of someone simple-minded concerning evil, the picture that comes to my mind is a fellow in the Old Testament named Joseph. You know the story of Joseph. He was sold as a slave by his lovely brothers. Uh, they sold him off. And he ended up in Egypt in uh, Potiphar's household as a servant. Potiphar's wife took a shining, a liking to young Joseph. Thought he was handsome, was interested in him. He, she kept, uh, what's the word, coming on to him. And he kept saying, no, uh, I serve my master. That would be unfaithful. That would be wrong. And uh, So he kept doing that. Uh, but then finally, she had enough of being persuasive, and uh, she grabbed him and asked him to come and sleep with her, and in the end, he didn't stop and try to intelligently discuss the situation or reason it out with her or think about the pros and cons of the situation. He ran. He ran. He ran so fast, he left his clothes behind. Well, his coat. He left his coat behind. She grabbed him, and he took off. And then she accused him of the one that instigated the situation. And, and I screamed, and he left his coat behind. He got in big trouble. He paid a big price for that, even though he was innocent. But that's what comes to mind when I think of being uh, simple when it comes to evil, when it comes to sin. Uh, you don't mess with it. You don't negotiate. You don't uh, weigh it up. You leave it alone. Stay away from it. That would be God's desire for all of us. Run. Run like Joseph did. Run. Don't try to be clever with sin. Others may not understand it, but be simple when it comes to sin and evil. Verse 20. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now likely this statement is referring to those false teachers who were smooth talking and flattery. flattering. That's what this is talking about. God will take care of them. God's going to take care of them. And Paul's wanting them to be wise and be drawn to the Lord and the word in dealing with them as well. He's saying, God's going to take care of that. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. And then come a couple of greetings from those with Paul. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Tertius wrote the letter. Did you realize that? This is the letter from Tertius. Tertius, though, was the stenographer. Paul wrote the letter. Uh, Tertius was the one who penned it down under Paul's direction. This was not an uncommon thing to have a stenographer ascribe someone who was good at writing and able to do it quickly, like a secretary, if you would. Gaius, my host and the host of the whole church, greets you. Gaius was Paul's host in Corinth and likely where uh, he was hosting a church in his own home. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. Literally, the treasurer of the city means the city's steward. Uh, exactly what this was, it was a position. He was someone of importance, influential, uh, 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 in charge of public works or something along these lines and Cortus, a brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's talk about the conclusion then. The secret mystery and then the purpose of the mystery and we'll close. He says in verse 25, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. This mystery gospel has the power to establish you. That's what he says. To establish you. To establish means literally to set fast. Strengthen. 
He means this message has the power to keep you firm in this life no matter what happens. When I think of this, I get a picture in my mind of what this looks like. Let me share this picture with you that I have in my mind. Have you seen this picture before? It was taken from 1989. This picture was a French lighthouse somewhere in the North Atlantic, and there was a big storm that was happening. Uh, do you see a guy at the doorway? Uh, that's a guy looking out of the door. This, by the way, what I understand, it's not a Photoshop. At first when I saw it, I thought, oh, yeah, right, that's a Photoshop image. You can't always believe what you see these days. But this is a 1989 picture, not a Photoshop. The guy heard a helicopter coming, and he came out to see if it was a rescue helicopter. He was waiting to, you know, be lifted out of this place. And it wasn't. It was some media helicopter. <laughs> and instead, they just want to take some pictures of the guy there. And, and I understand after he saw it wasn't and the wave came, he got inside safely and no one was harmed in this picture. So uh, praise God for that. But this is what I picture. Uh, I picture this as being set or established in the faith. That's us at the lighthouse. And the, and the waves and the storms are coming and battering on us. Uh, they're huge. And these are the trials that we face in life. They could destroy us if we didn't have this lighthouse. If we didn't have something that was set firm and established and immovable, even in the heavy storms and waves, we wouldn't last out there. If he was out there without the lighthouse out in the water, he wouldn't live. And that's us too. And this is what I picture of us being firmly established. This mystery gospel. He calls it a mystery, not because it's bizarre and mysterious. Well, it is mysterious to some extent, but it was hidden and kept un, um, more hidden in the Old Testament times. It was more hidden. They had glimpses. They, they saw it uh, unclearly. They had prophecies here and there. They had mentions of things, even back to the beginning in the garden, when uh, God said that, uh, he will bruise his heel and, and he will crush his head, referring to, again, we look back now and say, well, that's clearly the Messiah. But it wasn't clear completely back then. But they had glimpses and they knew that God would send a Messiah. That mystery. What's the purpose of the mystery? Verse 26, but now made manifest or known. And by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to faith. Underline the words all nations, obedience, and the faith. God desired all nations to believe and to obey. That was God's desire. From the beginning, God's promise to Abraham, in you, Abraham, all nations will be blessed. And that was his intent from the very beginning. All nations to believe and obey. I grew up singing an old song called Trust and Obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. When we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Remember the song? Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's the calling here. That's God's desire for all nations. And he closes with verse 27, to God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Take a moment to close our eyes, bow our heads. In Paul's greeting that he started with in the chapter, we saw so much diversity in the church of Rome. They were racially diverse, socially diverse, gender diverse. His closing words were words of caution to not be simple-minded. 
Don't be gullible. Don't be naive. Especially when it comes to teaching and preaching that is not consistent and lines up with God's word. Be wise. And then he told them that they indeed need to be simple. But in regards to sin, be simple. Don't play with it. Don't negotiate it. Run away from it. And we saw the mystery of the gospel hidden in the past, made known to all of us for the intent that all nations believe and obey. We're all nations. This church, I don't believe this church is so crazy unlike the Roman church. We'd look very much like that. Praise the Lord. This morning, I urge you, be committed in your heart to not being simple. Not being simple-minded. We don't have, I believe, a big problem with a lot of false teachers slipping into the church and flattering and smooth-talking. But we do have social media and YouTube all the time. And there's nothing I can do about that. So Paul's message to you is all the more vital. Don't be simple. Be wise. Be wise. Keep your focus on what does God say? What does the word of God say? And would you make it your commitment today to be simple when it comes to sin? Run from it. Sin weighs you down. It destroys your testimony. It destroys your witness. It destroys your credibility. Run from sin. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word to us all through Romans. It's been a fantastic journey, a doctrinal journey, a practical journey. And today, Father, as we see the kind of church that Rome was, we see ourselves in many ways in the diversity and we rejoice in it because we are one in Christ. There is not Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, but in Christ we are indeed one body. Thank you, Lord. But Lord, help us to not be simple-minded when it comes to when it comes to uh, false and wrong teaching and wrong things, but to be people of truth at all times. Help us, Lord, though, to be very simple when it comes to sin and not negotiate, not, not discuss it, but to run from sin in life, to keep ourselves spotless and pure, to be useful vessels for your work. Lord, thank you for the gospel hidden in the past, made manifest to all for the purpose that all nations should obey, should believe. Help us, Lord, to proclaim this gospel to all around us. Still, in Jesus' name, amen. Take a seat, please.